In the first century, Pompeii was the sin city of the Roman Empire. Here, Rome's elite reveled in sex and sadism. Meanwhile, the earliest followers of Jesus were preaching repentance to the Romans and predicting the end of days. And then it happened. The Vesuvius volcano erupted and wiped out Pompeii and neighboring Herculaneum. Was the eruption the best thing that could have happened to Christianity? Did Vesuvius provide Christianity with the launch it needed? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovic. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Volcanic eruptions have been known to influence the spread of religion. During the biblical exodus, it is said by many that the eruption of Thera in Greece helped Moses by generating catastrophes recorded in the Bible as the plagues. In modern times, the eruption of Krakatoa caused millions to convert to Islam, making Indonesia the most populous Muslim country in the world. But what about Christianity? Does it have its own volcano? I think it does. On the morning of August 24, 79 AD, the people of Pompeii woke up thinking that it was just another day in this playground of Rome's elites. But by 10 AM, a slight ash started to cover everything. By 2 in the afternoon, the ash turned coarser, driving people indoors. Others started fleeing the city. But it was too late. By 7.30 the next morning, the volcano sent a gas cloud 20 miles into the air. Boulders of fire then rolled down the side of the mountain, incinerating everything in their path. The bodies of the inhabitants were trapped in cocoons of hot ash, creating these casts that would immortalize the dead. As it turns out, the eruption may have been the catalyst for the spread of Christianity in the Roman Empire. To understand why, we're on the trail of a 2,000-year-old mystery. The investigation begins in the city of Herculaneum, also buried by the eruption. In February of 1938, while digging up the ancient city, archaeologists discovered something that could turn biblical history upside down. Today, the public is kept away from this site. They uncovered the clear imprint of a Christian cross that had been nailed to a wall and then pried loose. This cross can date no later than 79 AD, when the city was covered in ash for two millennia. The problem is that scholars believe that the cross, as a Christian symbol, did not come into use until 300 years after Vesuvius. Few people want to challenge this opinion, and yet, in a city that was covered in ash less than 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, here is a cross seemingly treated as a Christian symbol. How could that be anything but a cross? You see actually where it was bolted? When they found it, the floor was still there, and there are images where you had an altar in front of it and uh, a thing to kneel on. It's controversial because it's not supposed to be there, but what else can it be? This establishes crosses in 79. According to the church fathers, the earliest followers of Jesus, who were Jews, used a cross or an X as a symbol of their faith. For them, the X stood for the letter Tau, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The X symbolized the end, perfection, righteousness. The cross at Herculaneum suggests that 300 years before the Roman Empire converted to Christianity and adopted the cross as its symbol, in the Pompeii area, the Hebrew Tau was already morphing into the Gentile or Roman cross we recognize today. It's the upper room of a wealthy house. It's not really a chapel. I think it's a private bedroom of probably a Jewish or Christian slave. So I think unquestionably, in my mind, this uh, plastered remain is a cross, a T. 
But you know, some people will say it was too early, it couldn't be a cross, the cross is much later. Maybe it's a bookshelf, that's what people say, it's uh, a bracket. That's nonsense if you think about it. You look at the shape of it, this isn't how you would bracket a bookshelf. And then it's pried off the wall. Do you pry your bookshelf off the wall and run with it, you know, when the city's being destroyed? But the plaster tells the story. There's white plaster around it. This is to outline it and to say, this is the center of my devotion. And we have a early Christian text that's been overlooked. It's called the Letter of Barnabas. It's from the late first, early second century, so same time as the destruction of Pompeii. But the writer says that the letter T, which symbolizes the cross, stands for Jesus. To understand what Christians would be doing in the Pompeii area just 49 years after the crucifixion, the detective trail takes us back to where it all started, Jerusalem. In the year 66 AD, in Roman rule Judea, revolution had broken out. After four years of fighting, the Romans captured Jerusalem and its temple, Judaism's holiest site. The Roman general Titus torched the temple and turned hundreds of thousands of Jews into slaves. Among them were the earliest Christians from places like Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Nazareth. Some of these slaves must have known Jesus. Now they found themselves in places like Rome and Pompeii. They were disgusted by what they saw, a culture where power and violence were the currency of the day and sex was a religion. It's almost impossible to know just what to make out of all the sex in Pompeii. The way that just a great phallus can stick out uh, of a wall in a street as you walk past. If I'm a Christian or a Jew brought in as a slave to Pompeii, I'm walking down streets where there's phalluses, what would I have thought being thrown into the world that was Pompeii? I think what worries them is how they have to live. Do they have to live as slaves offering sexual services? That's where the real moral crunch will come. That's the grim law of, of, of war, that if you're defeated, you are enslaved, you're led off in captivity, and you have to do precisely the things, the giving pleasure to others, that is always unpleasant for you yourself. For these deeply religious slaves, it must have seemed as if they had stepped into Sodom and Gomorrah. And then, nine years after the destruction of the Jewish temple, Vesuvius erupted. Ironically, Titus, the very general who had destroyed the temple, was the newly installed emperor of Rome. It certainly is very clear in the early Christian narrative that the destruction of Pompeii is a consequence of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. What's far more interesting is to see that idea take shape in the Roman consciousness, and particularly in Emperor Titus's increasing paranoia. We're talking about someone who feared fire greatly, and for good reason, given what happened in Vesuvius. He's also facing an epidemic where people are febrile all throughout Rome, and that increasing fire within made Titus take cold baths and actually bury himself in snow. It was as if he was trying to fight back the force of fire itself, because he felt as though there was something he had not fully extinguished in the Temple of Jerusalem, as though this last ember of spirit had survived and the wrath of the God of Israel was coming for him. I believe that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79 drove thousands of Romans to join Judaism and its newly created sister religion, Christianity, especially Christianity. So I believe that while Paul gets all the credit, it's really Vesuvius that launched Christianity into a world religion. To test my thesis, I've set up a roadmap. I have to find evidence right here that there were Jews in Pompeii prior to the eruption. Why Jews? Let's remember at the beginning of the movement, they were all Jews, including Jesus and all his disciples. And secondly, I have to find evidence that these newly minted Christians, so to speak, warned their pagan Roman masters of the impending disaster. Why did they have to warn before? Well, because otherwise, the Romans wouldn't have seen the eruption of Vesuvius as divine punishment. So let's test the theory and follow the trail of evidence. We begin with the New Testament. 
The book of Acts describes the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. There, it states that he made a point of preaching in busy harbor towns where new ideas would quickly spread. He actually describes coming here to Putzwale, the harbor of Pompeii. Scholars believe this journey happened around 60 AD, six years prior to the Jewish revolt against Rome and 19 years before the eruption of Vesuvius. During the beginning of the first century, all the traffic that came from all over the Mediterranean came here through Pozzuoli. So in the book of Acts, when Paul lands... Uh, he's landing right here. Yeah. I mean, it's no accident that he's landing here when he's going to Rome. Right, this is the way people would have traveled. The coast between the Bay of Naples and Rome was too treacherous, and so people would sail here into Pozzuoli and then travel across land to get to Rome. It says that when Paul landed right over here, mm -hmm. uh, he was met by brothers. That means fellow yeah. Jews who are followers of Jesus, who had converted to this movement. Definitely Jews coming from the Holy Lands to Italy on their way to Rome would be passing through. That's amazing because that's Christians. Right, the religion is already spreading pretty quickly. Before so, Paul even gets here. Yeah, this is probably the Ellis Island of the ancient world. Seeking their fortunes in the capital of the empire, Jews like Paul were heading to Rome in droves. When Paul landed here in the year 60, he was put under house arrest for causing a disturbance. Two years later, he was released. And two years after that, he was beheaded. Paul was probably swept up in the mass persecutions of Christians that followed the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. The archeological evidence of the fire is here. The Circus Maximus, a massive racetrack that could seat over a quarter of a million spectators. One night in the year 64, the stables caught fire and the city of Rome burned. The response to the fire tells us there were already a lot of Christians in Rome prior to the Vesuvius eruption. So this is a fire that destroyed three quarters of the city. This is where Nero, according to legend, was fiddling while Rome was burning. Yes. What does uh, Nero do afterwards? Well, he blames the Christians for the fire. Now, the thing is, for Nero to blame the Christians in 64, there's got to be enough of them to make yes. that ac accusation credible, right? right that, that's what's amazing. But here we are only in 64. In 64. 30 years after the right. crucifixion. And here we have him being able to say, this is a group that's substantial enough. You all know who they are. And you all know that the troublemakers, they're doing illegal things. and they're the ones who are responsible for this. These early Christians, like Paul, who were blamed for the fire of Rome, were beheaded, fed to lions, and crucified for pagan Roman entertainment. Two years after the persecution of the Christians of Rome, the Jews of Judea rose in revolution. Four years after that, they were defeated. In the year 70 AD, Tens of thousands of Jewish slaves were brought to the Italian peninsula. Many of them were early Christians. New evidence suggests that with the help of a volcano, they were about to take over the Roman Empire. Most historians say that the Apostle Paul launched Christianity and the Roman Empire. But think about it. How could one man convert the most powerful empire the world had ever seen? No matter how effective Paul was at spreading the message of the Gospels, think how much more effective an act of God would be. I think that the eruption of the volcano Vesuvius in 79 AD gave Christianity a huge push, a push that history has forgotten. And the Romans would have perceived that volcanic eruption as an act of an angry God, to be precise, the God of Israel payback for Rome's destruction of the temple in Jerusalem just nine years earlier. At that time, the Romans torched the temple of Jerusalem and took tens of thousands of Jews to Rome as slaves. Many of these Jews were early Christians. To commemorate the victory over the God of Israel, the Romans built a number of monuments, including the Colosseum, they used Jewish and Christian slaves, financing the project with monies plundered from the temple. In the year 70, the Colosseum literally went up as the Jerusalem temple came down. 
And only a hundred yards from the Colosseum stands the Arch of Titus. The story carved on its stone surface is a boastful testimonial to the sacking of Jerusalem, a celebration of the looting of the temple's wealth and the persecution of hundreds of thousands of Jewish slaves from Judea. Oh, here we have really fantastically well-preserved example of a triumph procession. And a triumph was a mega parade. There was everybody. There was the emperor. Uh, there were slaves from the place that you conquered. There was all the spoils of war that you brought back. There was money. In this case here, they brought back the menorah from the sacking of the fabulously wealthy and ornate temple in Jerusalem. Rome destroys Jerusalem in 70. Mm -hmm. Jesus is crucified in 33. We're only talking 37 years. Right. Am I right? Some of the people following this procession mm -hmm. in chains may have actually heard Jesus preach. Yes, it's absolutely uh, within the realm of possibility. They definitely could have witnessed, seen, heard Jesus, and then ended up as fate would have brought them as a slave to Rome. According to the Gospels, Jesus had predicted the destruction of the temple. Now that it had happened, Jews generally, and in particular the followers of Jesus, were waiting for the Romans to be punished for their deeds. In the meantime, they would have been sent to places like Pompeii, serving as slaves in opulent Roman villas such as this one. Here, the followers of the God of Israel found themselves serving pagans who worshipped many gods. Every house in Pompeii had a shrine to their domestic gods, the gods of that household. But what you could do is you would have little statuettes of the gods you want to worship, and you could pick and choose. So a lot of merchants would have Mercury because he brought profit. All these gods are there to protect. There would have been only one group, the Jews and the Jesus followers among the Jews, that would have said, God's not going to protect you. You burned down his house in Jerusalem. You're going to be punished unless you change your ways. Yeah, exactly. It's a very different way of thinking. The Romans may not have been thinking about divine punishment, but the slaves were. There's very clear evidence in, in the Acts and in other documents that Christianity was a religion that had a major appeal in the slave community. But it would be hard to get at archaeologically. In antiquity, there's a hierarchy of ways of writing. So the grandest bit, the public bit, is you take a great big piece of marble and you write in great big letters that high the name of the emperor and the official announcement. Whereas the graffito, with a, a little scratching thing, maybe a stylus or so on, written on the wall in a hurry by someone who shouldn't have been writing on the wall there, you may just catch a bit of a trace of the suppressed Christian voice. Professor Wallace is right. The suppressed voice can be heard in overlooked graffiti. The first one on the wall of an ancient toilet. Here we are in a latrine. I think this is one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the presence of Jews in Pompeii. This whole wall, basically, of the latrine is taken up with a humongous message. It's not a very nice message, but it names a woman named Martha. Hebrew. Right, it is Hebrew. And here's what it says. This is the dining room of Martha, and then at the very end, Kakat. She is defecating in her dining room. So Martha, whoever's writing about Martha, say, look, look at Martha, she, she craps where she eats. Yeah. But not only do we have the name Martha, triclinium, is spelled T-R-I-C-L-I-N-U-M in Latin. It's spelled as it sounds. But here, triclinium has an H in it, so it would be pronounced triclinium instead of triclinium. A Latin speaker from Italy would have never written, would have never said it that way. They would have just said triclinium. Martha and the person who's writing about her Definitely. Or probably both Jews. Yeah, and, and probably slaves. And actually, you can see that if you're sitting here using the latrine, you would be looking directly at that wall with this huge inscription that's really hard to miss. So basically, it gives us hard archaeological evidence that there were Jews, maybe Judeo-Christians, slaves, in Pompeii prior to the eruption. Yes. So a crudely scratched joke on the wall of a latrine becomes solid evidence that there were Jews and perhaps Christians in Pompeii at the time of the eruption. And 
They were slaves. That's the key. These slaves may well have been the key players in Rome's conversion to Christianity. Think about it. Slaves like Martha may have heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and yet ended up in a Pompeii brothel. I'm convinced that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii and neighboring Herculaneum also helped launch Christianity in the Roman world. So far, we've shown evidence that Hebrew and perhaps Christian slaves were living in Pompeii at the time of the eruption. We've also seen that one of these slaves had the Hebrew name Martha. The evidence suggests that people like Martha helped convert Rome from paganism to Judaism and especially Christianity. But when she got here, the best Martha could hope for was to be a household servant. The alternative was life in a brothel. Here oh. we go. Here we're in the uh, hallway. It's smaller than a real Yeah, this is the first room. They had cushions on these beds, right? They did. There would have been cushions. Pompeii was a really busy city with people traveling through, and this was a place where you could meet people from all over. Are these free women or slaves? These are probably slaves. I know some people see this as erotic. It's quite violent. Well, if you were a slave in the ancient world, you really didn't have much control over your life. So it was certainly not a very nice existence. But is there any evidence that some of these women who ended up in this brothel were Christians, brought as slaves after the fall of Jerusalem? Just across the street, there is a building known as the Hotel of the Christians. And we're heading into the atrium. This is called the Hotel of the Christians, partly because there are many small rooms around the atrium, so it's thought that this could have served as some sort of hospitality establishment, but of the Christians because very early on in 1862, there was discovered a very enigmatic graffito. But there's this one word that has fascinated everyone, Christianos. This charcoal graffiti had been preserved under ash for 1,800 years until archeologists uncovered it. Exposed, it became susceptible to the elements. Because it was written in charcoal, it just needed a few rains and some sun, and it disappeared within two years. But in the short time between its discovery and its disappearance, there was only time for two experts to make tracings of it. So everyone has been working off of these tracings that were done in 1862. Then it would be the earliest archaeological attestation to the word Christian anywhere. Christianos, yeah, as, as an identity. Now, the problem was that nobody could make heads or tails of it, correct? Pretty much. There's a lot of writing, obviously. It's more than one word, but the writing around it seems to be pretty puzzling. Kind and of gibberish. So in 1926, Professor Newbold comes up with the idea that, that what? Comes up with the idea that we have an inscription that mentions Christianos that is transliterated Aramaic, and it's written in Latin characters. Aramaic is a Hebrew-like language that Jesus spoke. According to this theory, to understand the inscription, all we have to do is swap the Latin letters for Aramaic ones. When you do that, you know, I can even understand from modern Hebrew, it says a strange mind has overtaken A, doesn't mention who A is, who is now being held as a prisoner among the Christians. Now, that makes a bit of sense to me. If you come with a bunch of guys mm. to a hotel mm. across the street from a brothel, and suddenly one of the guys you're expecting to party with disappears, he's not doing that anymore. He's seen the light, he's born again. You may very well scratch on the wall. He's being held prisoner and missing all the fun. We now have archaeological evidence that some of these sex slaves were fighting back with religion. They were converting some of the pagan Romans to the new religion, Christianity. We now even almost know one of them by name, by his first initial, A. But if some of these Romans were converting to Christianity, what happened to them? What happened to A? From the texts, we know that wild dogs were let loose on Christians wrapped in animal skins. And amazingly, in nearby Putswale, we have physical evidence of those early Christians. 
we have ancient graffiti of a man wrapped in an animal skin. Dating to the first century AD, this is the oldest graffiti of a crucifixion ever found. It caricatures the person crucified by depicting him with a big nose. The crucifixion is depicted from behind so you can clearly see the cross. It was photographed in 1926, but today, as with so many other graffiti finds, nobody seems to know where it actually is. Following the original archeological report, which states that the crucifixion was scratched on an ancient tavern wall, Simca and Rebecca set out to find it. It's like one of the earliest crucifixion thing. I thought we could just drive up to it. No, I mean, all the authorities I've been talking to, they know nothing about this thing. So I would suggest, let's try up here. Okay. Let's try. Eh, hanno trovato qui, in questa zona, sì. una serie di taberne. Che arriva vicino alla posta. Okay. Qua. Oh, perché lì si è there. Grazie. Grazie. Mille, oh, mille grazie. Bene. Bene. Ancient, antico, antico. Roberto archeologico. Ok. Probabile si vede, c'è anche la tabella là se vede. Ok, perfetto. Qua subito la tabella. After a few wrong turns, the investigators think they finally found the network of ancient taverns. These are definitely Roman ruins oh, look, because you this see is plaster. so huge. Yeah. There are probably taverns all over the place. So you're under some building and you've got yep. a Roman basement. Yeah, what would be interesting is to if we could go in, walk through that little hallway there and see if that's in fact just one room back there or if it's connected to other space. Right, it looks pretty... Wait. Hey. Nothing like trying the door. <laughs> I think we're getting in. Here, follow me. You know, a flashlight is the archaeologist's best friend. Ah, great, here we are. I just happen to have one. It's not open to the public. No, and the rooms just keep going and going. It just keeps going, yeah. Oh my gosh, there's ancient plaster right there. <laughs> this wall with oh. white, this looks like an ancient A because yeah. in ancient graffiti, instead of having a horizontal bar, it's usually diagonal like this. A treasure trove of ancient graffiti, but no sketch of a crucifixion. Simca and Rebecca persevere. After hours of hunting, they find the exact spot where the crucifixion graffiti was originally discovered. But whatever is not etched in stone is disappearing fast. This is why it's hard to find graffiti, is because plaster is so friable, it easily comes off of walls. And we're incredibly lucky when someone takes a photo and publishes it, because that is probably all we're going to have 50 years later. Luckily, the photograph survives. Evidence that prior to the eruption of Vesuvius, hundreds, perhaps thousands of Romans, people like A, paid with their lives for their Christian faith. And yet, pagan Rome was not succeeding in wiping out the new religion. In fact, there's archaeological evidence that worshippers of the God of Israel were warning their Roman masters that they were marked for utter destruction. When it comes to ancient artifacts, people like big things, villas, pillars, temples. They ignore little things, like graffiti. But as we've seen, graffiti can tell you a lot. In Pompeii, graffiti tells us that there were Jews and Christians right here before the eruption. Not only that, graffiti shows us that some of these Christians were converting their Roman masters to their newfound religion. In fact, these new converts were paying a heavy price for what they now believed. We saw the earliest image of a crucifixion found anywhere. And we have archaeological evidence that the Jews and Christians of Pompeii were warning their Roman masters, were warning their pagan neighbors that they would soon suffer the wrath of the God of Israel. In 1921, a photograph was published of graffiti scratched on wall plaster. Attached to the published photograph were directions to a specific Pompeii address, House 14. Should be here. You see how the plaster is gone. Yeah. But luckily, we have a really good photo. We have two words, one in Greek, one seemingly in Latin, and then two stars. What do you make of this? Well, start with the middle word. So that's an attempt in Latin letters to represent the word karam, which is one of the most chilling words in the Hebrew language. That's the word used in the Bible when God utterly 
blots out a place. Sodom and Gomorrah were made carom. And then you've got the poinium, which is not a, a Latin word, but it's a Latinized word. I think it has to be from the Greek poine, which means to smite. So smite, utterly destroy, and then the two stars. They're five-pointed, they're the Solomon stars. Uh, we see them on magic bowls. What it shows us is that people in this culture, particularly Jews and Christians, were warning their friends and neighbors and saying, just wait. You think you're in the lap of luxury, you think everything's fine, everything's peaceful, just wait, because God has something to say. In an effort to identify the context in which the harem graffiti was found, Simka and Professor Tabor go to an on-site storage facility. This is the office, come. They want to identify the house where the graffiti was found. Suddenly, to their surprise, a worker brings out the original harem inscription. The plaster was taken off a wall some 50 years ago, and until now, everyone's only had the photograph. Finally, here is the original. They said it doesn't exist anymore. Never thought I would see it. So here's harem, it couldn't be any clearer. And there's ponium, it's so clear. And there are the two Solomonic stars. What's the significance of finding it in Pompeii? I knew it was in a house, but whose house? And what else do we know about this person? And that's the most important thing with archaeology is to interpret the uh, graffiti, but also where was it found? Context. Yeah, the context. So that it tells more of a story than just the words. Just then, Francesco, one of the workers who was around during the discovery of this graffiti, comes out. If you can explain where this was found. This is not what had been published. House 14 is wrong. The house of Paco Procolo was found with a painting of the owner and his wife on the wall. Simca can see that Francesco sent him to the right place. It's clear where the plaster came from, right in the doorway. It seems that the Stars of Solomon are a kind of amulet designed to protect the family from the harem or destruction that they felt was coming. People put all their pagan stuff right in the doorways to kind of protect the house. It makes sense that a Christian, a Jew, who rejected paganism would put his inscriptions also in the vestibule. Do we know anything about this man? He is the owner of some panifici here in Pompeii. During a trip to Jerusalem, he was converted practically to the Christian religion. How do we know that he converted to Christianity? He has made to the signs allusive. We have testimonies. He has made to see the signs allusive that were on the forms. The phalluses. The big phallus. He covered. Yes. It's a sign of piety. Whoever owned this bakery, this used to be a bakery, used to have these penises, phalluses, for a good luck charm. But then, here's the key. See the two tones over there? The two tones tell you something. It tells you that it was plastered over. It means that whoever held by that lucky charm suddenly didn't want it there. He converted to Christianity. Francesco shows Simco one final astonishing piece of evidence. The same bakery owner who wrote biblical words on his doorway and had phalluses covered over put a cross in one of his bakeries. They found also a cross in a bakery. Wait, 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 wait. wait, 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 wait. It looks like exactly like the one in Herculaneum. The significance of this cross here, it's graffiti. And it's graffiti that looks almost exactly in terms of the plaster, like the cross that was found in Herculaneum. Where was it found? It was found over the oven. This settles the issue of Herculaneum because they weren't keeping books up there on a shelf. It must have been a religious symbol. The cluster of clues pointing to an early Christian movement in Pompeii is incredible. A cross found in a bakery, a baker who covers phallic symbols, and the same baker who in his own home has a graffiti of the Hebrew word marked for utter destruction. It seems that he was trying to protect his family from what he believed was imminent destruction. That destruction was not long in coming. 
In 79 AD, just nine years after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, ash began to rain down on Pompeii. Right where we're standing now, we would have been inside the volcano, inside the nozzle of a giant rocket engine that's firing its uh, thrust straight up into space, basically. 10,000 tons of rock that are going up into the atmosphere per second. It flows like a giant red-hot tsunami over the land. And the cloud itself is hot enough to radiate enough heat to ignite the t trees that are pinwheeling toward people. If you saw this thing coming, you would try to get away, but you, you just did not have a chance. To experience the devastation from the perspective of a Pompeian family, Charles Pellegrino takes Simca from the mouth of the volcano to a middle-class home on the edge of the city. So, Charlie, what's the significance of this place? Some of the Roman letters and writings that have survived, specifically Pliny the Younger, who was 17 years old at the time, he gives us the time of the start of the eruption, around lunchtime. And what we're seeing here is the relatively gentle eruption. You have uh, people who are able to climb up on top of the pumice, hoping that whatever is going on, it is going to slow down, it's going to stop. It's almost like people at a flood. You keep trying to go higher, right. and then you hope it stops, and then you're going to drain. Right, and right on top of this very sequence higher up, we find the people themselves. OK, now let's follow in the footsteps of the family. OK. That, that, take us right up. Perhaps the people are able to make some kind of rudimentary shelter, which is suggested by the wood that we see here. Herculaneum dies between 12 and 1 AM. The first surge cloud goes right through Herculaneum, hotter than steel emerging white hot from a furnace. And within about a three second period, every person, every animal, every plant, the termites and even the bacteria are instantly carbonized. Over here in Pompeii, life still goes on for a while. But at about 7.30 AM, right the here? fourth surge cloud. This is right here. Right here, literally megatons of it, and it surges across the ground like a tsunami made out of ash. And here, the people would have died in a time frame within two seconds, possibly less than one second. These are the people who were able to climb up on top of it. Here, you can even see one figure that's putting an arm over another figure. There are skeletons inside every one of these casts. Now, this is very, very sad, because it looks like somebody's sheltering, maybe a, a child and a parent. Well, what we have here, we won't know until we x-ray this one. Oh, my god. But it could be bloating, or it could be a man trying to oh shelter my. from the ash, getting into the mouth of someone who was pregnant. The minute you said that, I suddenly realized yeah. we're looking at a pregnant woman, and her husband is trying to shelter her. Yeah, and it speaks for us all, you know, that in a moment like this, you have this moment of mutual human tenderness that might be a different civilization, but these people are us. A few weeks after the eruption that may have killed as many as 20,000 people, an overwhelming number by ancient standards, Pompeii was a cold corpse of a city. People had died where they were. Thousands of bodies lay in their homes and out in the streets. The whole city was buried in small pumice stones and ash, up to the top floors. But there is evidence that after the eruption, Romans from other towns tunneled down to floor level, crawling on their hands and knees coming face to face with the destruction. The tunnelers recorded their interpretation of the events as the wrath of God. Post Fata Novissima, after the most recent Fata, the sun strengthens these pleasing to God people against the cold people. Almost like a biblical reference that this is punishment, divine wrath. There are those people, and this is a very biblical terminology, who are 
pleasing to God. And there are those people, the pagans, who are not pleasing to God, and they're dead, they're frozen. You can literally see the wrath of God. Strikingly, the eruption of Vesuvius parallels a much earlier story that Jews and Christians knew all too well, Sodom and Gomorrah, sister cities whose inhabitants were notorious for their sexual deviations. The book of Genesis records that as punishment for their sins, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire and brimstone. Incredibly, there's a graffiti that directly links Pompeii to Sodom and Gomorrah. Today been made into a kind of modern guardhouse, but in the first century, this was somebody's home. And maybe the day of the eruption, or even the day before the volcanic eruption, somebody hastily scrawled on the wall in charcoal the chilling words, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, somebody literally is writing this while the ash is falling down. Possibly, yeah. It's not there anymore. It was on one of these walls that's now modern plaster. Yeah. And it's been taken off to some museum. What do you make of this charcoal inscription showing up here? This has to be a Jew or a Christian who's thinking, why is the volcano erupting? Because this is Sodom and Gomorrah, and God is punishing this place. It's amazing. Aren't we imposing our view how they would have interpreted it? What do we have that says, you know what, now we know that Christians and Romans interpreted the eruption of Vesuvius as the divine wrath of God. In the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, if you read that, it has to be a description of the destruction of Pompeii. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, you tell me that... Pompeii is mentioned in the New Testament, not by name. What the text says is Babylon is gonna fall. Babylon means Rome. So it's everything from the city of Rome, the culture of Rome, but the date of that text is from the time of the Emperor Titus, and it's around the year 79 this text is written. And it talks about the city will be destroyed in one hour. The smoke of its burning will be seen in the harbor and mentions fornication and immorality. Allegorically, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. What you're suggesting is that hiding in plain sight in the New Testament itself, the interpretation was that this is divine retribution. They saw the burning of Pompeii as the beginning of the end. As Rome is headed down, how do we know? Because God burned it in a single day like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what happened right where we're standing. I can just imagine a slave from the Holy Land cringing in a corner. There's nowhere to run, and ash is raining down. He or she, someone like Martha, would have seen the glory of the temple in Jerusalem and its destruction. Then in Pompeii as a slave, they would have witnessed and maybe even experienced violence and orgies. Now, as Vesuvian ash was coming down, I can imagine Martha dipping into it and writing the epitaph of Pompeii, Sodom and Gomorrah. Less than two years after the eruption, the Emperor Titus died. A few Romans converted to Judaism, but a more sizable group converted to the new, more accessible Jewish sect already being called Christianity. It was this group that laid the foundation for the whole empire to become Christian less than 250 years after the eruption. And for Christianity to become, to this day, the most populous religion in the world. And all this was accomplished with a little help from a volcano called Vesuvius.